Hello, it's Miss Adams from Flamingo Math. In lesson three, day one, we're going to look at rates of change in linear and quadratic functions. Before we get into the lesson, let's talk about the idea of a secant line. It's a line that joins two points on a function, and you can see that secant line PQ in this image on our notes. Notice that the average rate of change is the slope, which creates that secant line here, PQ. Moving on to example one, we want to sketch the secant line through the points that are shown on the graph. We want to find the slope of the secant line from the ordered pair negative 2, negative 6 to the point 3, 4. You should be able to do that without any problem. The slope of the secant line is the average rate of change between the two points. So y2 is 4 minus y1, that's negative 6, divided by x2, which is 3, minus x1, which is negative 2. So 4 minus negative 6 is 10, 3 minus negative 2 is 5, the slope of the secant line is 2. So the slope of the secant line is also known as the average rate of change of the function over the closed interval from negative 2 to 3 inclusively. And we can write that description for example 1, part b. Moving on to example 2, for the function g of x, is x plus 4 times x minus 2. Find the slope of the secant line from the point negative 1, g of negative 1, to the point 2, g of 2. Now this requires us to calculate the y value at negative 1 and substituting negative 1 here and here. We have negative 1 plus 4, that's 3 and then negative 1 minus 2, that's negative 3, so the g of 1 is negative 9, and then we need the g of 2, so the g of 2 doing the same thing, substituting a 2 here, 2 plus 4 is 6, and 2 minus 2 is 0, so the g of 2 is 0. To calculate the slope of the secant line, which is our average rate of change, we want to find the g of 2 minus the g of negative 1 divided by 2 minus negative 1. The g of 2 is 0. The g of negative 1 is negative 9. And then 2 minus negative 1. So it looks like we have 9 divided by 3. Our average rate of change is 3. In example 3, we're going to use a table of values for function h here. And notice that the input values are equal length intervals. And we've got our output values here. And our job is to find the average rate of change over the given intervals. So these are x values. We want to know the average rate of change between negative 2 and negative 1. So we want to use the slope formula with the difference in the y values divided by the difference in the x values. I'll do the first one, and then you can turn the video off and do the next three. The change in y is negative 5 minus negative 7 divided by the change in x, negative 1, minus negative 2. So 7 minus 5 is 2 and 2 minus 1 is 1, so 2 minus 1, we have the average rate of change is 2. We use these x values for the denominator and these y values for the numerator. Turn the video off, give it a try, and then come back and check your work against mine. If you worked everything carefully, each one of your average rates of change is 2. So our question is, in part B, what is the change in the average rate of change going through each interval 
down our table of values, we see that the change in the average rate of change is nothing. Or you could say it's constant. The average rate of change of h of x is constant. We could also say the rate of change of the average rates is zero. So you want to be careful that you use the language correctly. The average rate of change of the function h is constant, and the rate of change of the average rates is zero. So in this example, we saw that the average rate of change over an any length input value interval is constant for a linear function. And the rate of change of the average rates of change is zero. That is, the average rate of change is changing at a rate of zero. Now, in the next example, we'll take a look at what happens in a quadratic function. So here in example four, we're going to see that the average rate of change over consecutive equal length input value intervals will be given by a linear function. Now, what does that mean when we're talking about the rate of change? So just like the example before, if we look at the average rate of change between negative 2 and negative 1, we're looking at 3 minus 11 divided by negative 1 minus negative 2. So 3 minus 11 divided by negative 1 minus negative 2 is 8, negative 8. And for the next interval, it looks like negative 1 minus 3 divided by 0 minus negative 1, which would be negative 4. And likewise, through the other two intervals, we get the slope is 0 on the interval from 0 to 1. And then on the interval from 1 to 2, the slope is 4. So next we want to figure out what's happening in the change in the average rate of change. So going from negative 8 to negative 4, it looks like we had to add 4 from negative 8. If we add 4, we get to negative 4. And to get to 0, we would add 4 more. And to get to 4, we would add 4 more to 0. So what is the change in the average rate of change? We could say that the average rate of change of f of x, average rate of change of f of x is changing at a constant rate of 4. And that's what the uh, bulleted points at the beginning are talking about. The average rate of change of f of x is changing at a constant rate of 4. So the table of values that we're given here in this example would be an example of a quadratic function since the average rate of change since the change in the average rate of change is a constant 4. Here's a summary of what we've just discovered. Over any length input value interval, the average rate of change of a linear function is constant. If we're given consecutive equal length input value intervals, the average rate of change of a quadratic function will be given by a linear function. And the average rate of change over some closed interval from A to v, B is known as the slope of the secant line. In a quadratic function, we can determine the curvature or concavity of the graph by considering the average rate of change over those equal length input intervals. So let's sketch some secant lines on the graphs that's shown below. I like to use red in this case. Here we have a negative slope, and then we've got a positive slope, and a little steeper positive slope, and a steeper positive slope. 
So it's accurate to say in this case that the slope is increasing. In the concave down, if we draw those secant lines, we've got a positive slope and then a negative slope and a little more negative slope. And as it goes to the right, we're decreasing in our slope values. This leads us to the idea of concave up, when the average rate of change over equal length input value intervals are increasing, our function is concave up, and we saw that in example five. And when the average rate of change over those equal length input value intervals are decreasing, then our function is gonna be concave down. In example six, a table of output values of a function g is given for equal length input values, and we want to find the average rate of change over those given intervals. I would recommend that you turn off the video, calculate those average rates of change, and let's see if you really understand what's going on with this table of values for our function h of x. And then come back to check your work against my work. If you calculated everything correctly, you got 9, 3, negative 3, and negative 9. And you can tell by looking at those rates, those are decreasing rates. So to answer part A, we noticed that the rates were decreasing. And that would tell us that the function of h of x, the function is a quadratic function, and it is concave down. This is the end of Lesson 3, Part 1.